Hi everyone. So today we'll see, uh, first of all, yeah, welcome to my talk that is titled High Performance Cost Sharing Between Android, iOS, and Web. So uh, before talking about the topic, I want to present myself. I'm Giovanni Rapidara. I'm developer advocate in Amazon for the App Store and services in Amazon. And before doing, like, before going deep inside developer advocacy, I was a software engineer. Before I was a mobile engineer in uh, Android field, but before was like, uh, when I was working in Italy, I um, was a software engineer in performance critical software. Uh, what does it mean? I, I was working like creating, developing software for space and defense field. In this kind of field, the performance are really important. Uh, nowadays that we can see the same needs for performance where we are talking about uh, machine learning algorithm, uh, sensor analysis that's more related to mobile. Uh, so like analyzing inputs coming from the sensor, or even if we are, if we need to do like video transcoding, uh, um, image elaboration, something like that. In this kind, in this field, the performance are really important. Uh, so. What does it mean here in performance? Because performance is a generic term. Uh, in the case of like of performance critical software for defenses in, uh, in space fields, uh, performance would mean like having a, a certain time in which the algorithm will were giving some output. So like we can be sure that the algorithm that we are running, the function that we are running, will have a certain output limited in a certain amount of time. So we need to be sure that the time uh, limit is respected. When we are developing something for mobile, we are not really used to, um, to, to develop high performance algorithm or high performance code, uh, because we are always like used to develop apps. I mean, for the majority of cases, we are developing apps that are uh, for the user like the user interface for something that is relying on the backend, uh, even though oh, there are like performance critical software, uh, even if we think about gaming in the mobile platform, that's, that is something that really needs the you, uh, that it really needs for you to develop something that is really, like we say, low level. Uh, and so coupled with the underlying architecture of the machine, underlying architecture of the hardware. But it's important, even for the normal application, to understand exactly the importance of performance. Because actually, the, our mobile platform are uh, built on top of limited resources. This can be battery, this can be memory. So even if the hardware is improving, they uh, is improving every year, we need to take care of this, especially for, for what uh, concern, what, especially for what is related to the new uh, of, of use case like machine learning and so on. So sometimes these features are very hardware related and a way to, uh, to develop something on top of it is thinking about performance. In mobile development, we are used to to a lot of different languages, iOS with Swift, or like uh, if you are coming from under development, from the under developer world, uh, you are used to use Kotlin, Java in the past. Uh, there, is a, there are people like using uh, C Sharp for gaming, the Xamarin, uh, I forget about Flutter, but we have a lot of frameworks. But if you think about this framework in language, like I said before, they are more designed around building the perfect user experience, building the perfect environment for developers to build the, the, a beautiful UI, a performant UI, but not like really a performant algorithm inside that is like inside your app. So uh, yeah, there are like, there is still like the, also the, the fight between the two main platform about which one is the more performance related even to app development. So like some people say, oh, uh, if I develop something on uh, iOS, the, uh, my application will be more performance than the one in Android. So I don't want to be in this fight, but if we need to like, uh, I don't want to be like in this like flame, but if we want to design and develop something that is performance oriented, we need to take care we need to think about a solution that is like creating 
a common engine that is associated to that hardware that is quite common related of, on the related on the mobile platform. Let's think about the architecture of the microprocessors, the RAM. That kind of hardware is pretty common and like it's pretty like standardized. Which, yes, you can have some differences here and there, but the architecture is the same. And running closer at that layer, closer on that layer, your algorithm will actually improve your performance. So, what about uh, as a solution for? for use cases that needs high performance uh, um, algorithm, what about like developing a library that can be also shared between this between the mobile platform? So to use this like in the past, but even now, many users like, for, to do like uh, high performance algorithm, they are using C. But in mobile, we can use a, we can try to understand if we can uh, use other languages, we can use and I will explain in this talk, we can use C++, we can use Kotlin, and we can use Rust. These are the, the three languages of choice that I choose for this talk. Uh, C++ is, it was like, it's the oldest one, if we think about it. And it's the one that also uh, is related to high performance development for all kinds of hardware, not only the mobile platform. Kotlin is pretty new uh, in the scene between, I mean, yeah, between it's the three, the newest is Rust. Uh, but it's like the most, if we can say, higher level on the tree. And Rust is uh, like uh, the newest one that is like close as perf the performance uh, as C++. We will see, and we will, we will see these three. How can we develop something like a some library that can be shared between mobile platform, so iOS and Android, and even web using these three languages. In this talk, we will see like what are the pros and the cons, if it's really easy to use these three languages instead of the others, we'll see this. And in the end, we are gonna like try to find, not a winner, but my favorite, like I like associated this slide, like the, the story of the three little pigs, like, comparing the, the pigs with the languages. Actually, they are not pigs, they're really great language, all trees. Uh, but I will tell you which one is my favorite. So let's start with C++. C++ is like one of the oldest one, like I say, is a powerful cross-platform language. It's a cro actually cross-platform because it can compile, it's compiled and can run across a lot of ca kind of architecture and processor and CPUs. So it's widely used to create a performance application. So like I said, not only mobile, it was created as a better version of C. So it's uh, that is right, really the, the one that is like also more closer to the machine than other languages, C. Uh, so it was like a, a tentative to improve C. It has a large and active co community. That's because it's really old. And if you think about even many operative systems are built with C++. And because the community is very active and large, there are a lot of libraries and frameworks available that you can use to develop whatever you want. So the possibilities are really endless with C++. Uh, nevertheless, it's really, it can be complicated to learn and to really understand deeply what you can do and with C++ without errors or issue that can raise after your pro after your software is running. Uh, also another thing like, yeah, it's one of the most popular programming languages, like I said, it's like object oriented. That in the past was something uh, really uh, take, really take as a, a, as a good, uh, good thing, like the object programming. But nowadays we are all more oriented into uh, functional programming. It's something old as well, but you know, like trends are like constantly repeating. And it's portable. So like I said before, you can decide to build your algorithm, your function, your software in C++ and compile with a specific compiler for the architecture for the machine that you want. So just an hello world of C++ is a friendly, I don't know if somebody doesn't know uh, about C++. This is like a classic hello world. You can have like a function. The main function is like the entry point of the of the uh, the source code of your the, or your software that you're building. 
Uh, you can include uh, libraries using the header file include. And you can uh, use uh, namespace to operate like uh, includes uh, ob including included object from the header files. Uh, yes, it's pretty easy. You can handle like uh, memory. You can handle memory with that using the pointer. Something that we are not really using anymore with uh, the high level language uh, like Java or Kotlin. And handle the pointer sometimes can uh, make us face some problem that are not really easy to solve. Like in this slide, like yes, you have a pointer to an integer. Uh, you have another pointer to a cost integer, so I presume that I will never modify. I can never modify the cost uh, PCI because it's a cost. Instead, I mean, it's permitted if you actually cast the cost int pointer to a normal int pointer, and this way uh, you can change it. So, like sometimes that can be a little bit like uh, dangerous to use C++. Uh, I mean, C++, this is not only, this is one of the um, pitfalls that we, that you can have with the last part, but there are many others. How can we use, like, going to our main topic, how can we use C++ in, C++ in mobile app development? So if we are into the iOS app, iOS app development world, C++ is like a first class citizen. What does it mean? This means that if you are using OJTC, still, because many developers are using Swift right now, you just need to embed your C++ code inside a .mm file. That's it. And then you can use a C++. So you can use whatever uh, algorithm you want to find it in C++. Uh, you can find uh, whatever implementation of a high performance algorithm you need for your like software, for your app in C++, and just include, and just include that inside your object C, object C uh, iOS uh, app like this. If you're using Swift, that things are really a little bit more complicated uh, because you need to use a wrapper to expose the classes. So you need to use an objective C++ wrapper to use the classes. And this is like called a bridging header. Uh, you can check more info about it in the official developer documentation of Apple. So developer.apple.com and the, you, the following the URL at the slide. But essentially, yeah, you can like use your .h to the header file of C++, .cpp and then .ocxx, and then you need to import your uh, header inside a file, another file that is the bridging header. That is something that is like, uh, uh, it's a bridge between the Swift code and the C++ file or um, library that you are building. Uh, then you have to do some a little bit more uh, some configuration of Xcodes, like linking the the library if you are using an external library or like, yeah some configuration that, that that still is a little bit easier than working with Gradle. Uh, Improvement. There is a, a work group that started last year. Uh, yeah, it started last year on January 2022, uh, and it's about like creating a better interoperability between Swift and C++. This is because it's like a, a need of developers that are like uh, wanting, that are uh, the, the developers that want more and more performance with their application. So for Swift, this is like more or less the introduction about how to use C++. What about Android? So uh, to use, C++ in Android, you have to download a bunch of tools. You have to download CMake, the NDK, that is the native development kit of Android. Uh, you have to configure Gradle, and then you have to download the LDB. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of tools to configure and download and install, but Android Studio, that is the default environment of Android development, is helping you uh, for, for this. There is also like a demo project that you can use uh, in Android Studio to check. And another thing that you like uh, have to implement if you have to use a C++ clause is like, because you are using uh, essentially a, a language that is on top of JVM, so you can use Java or Kotlin, 
you have to use the uh, JNI, so Java Native Interface, to call C methods that are wrapping C++ methods. So this is like the, if you want like a little bit forced architecture of what you can do uh, for, um, for integrating C++ code inside a, a, a project that is an under project. And to wrap your C++ method inside a gen, in it, a gen I method, you have to use the code that is on, this, on the left of the slide. So in the file natively for C++, CPP. Then after that, you can use in your main activity, the uh, methods called from the, that has the name from the gen I. Uh, I want to show you like one demo. I think you can see here like this. Yeah, so this is like a super really demo project like in Android Studio about using uh, C++. And now you can see, and as you can see here, uh, you have the string from JNI, JNI that is actually an external function. That means there is a library written in C++ that is implementing this function. And this library uh, now is simply a dummy. It's like an hello word, like, you know. So like it's a, we said that it's a string from Genai uh, function that is like actually wrapping a, a C++ code. So like there is a constant string hello, and then we just build another. Uh, we are building a new string starting from that and like and returning it. The function from Genai called string from Genai, we just like return the string and we can use this string inside the text field that we can use for Android, uh, for, a, for our Android app. So this is pretty easy and simple. But imagine that you have a much co more complicated code. So you will always have more complicated code than this hello world. It can mean really uh, hard to develop something because you need to write more and more configuration code, more and more code to wrap your methods that are like exported from, from C++. So uh, I started to look for a way to make this easier, even for Android, I mean, for Android, wrapping the methods in Gen, uh, with GNI call, but even like producing the uh, bridging header for Swift and for iOS. And I saw that there is a pretty good tool, pretty good framework called Gini that is helping a developer to integrate C++ code in both the platform, Android and iOS. So Gini is like a, a software, so a tool for generating cross language type declaration and interface bindings. It's on GitHub, it's open source. It's, it was created, it was started by Dropbox. Then Dropbox uh, left this project, discontinued this project, the past Snap, the company that is developing Snapchat, uh, took it from the open source and improved it a lot. And it's still open source. And you can check um, in the GitHub how the code is working. Uh, there is a bunch of tools to you know, like a command line commands to run to generate the code, and we will see in a bit the sample. But the good things like that is very, very high performance. And there are a, lot, a bunch of articles in the Snap uh, engineering blog about how they took Gini from Dropbox, from the open source world, and they improved it a lot. Uh, they, their needs uh, that they explain in their articles because they, are, they were creating a really high performance oriented messaging uh, layer. So pretty similar to the one that we saw in the, in the talk before, but also they have to leverage the expertise they had in the team uh, that was about C++. And because now was having a lot of expertise in C++ because like they work a lot with images and video, augmented reality. So something right, really high performance related and many developers that are there are developed with C++, these, using this kind of tool was like their, uh, their like silver tools, the silver bullets to cover their needs. 
so this is like a more or less the graph of the logic they are using. The snap is using using G Gini, so with a, a Gini that is creating the all the bindings for iOS, all the bindings for Android, and even a bunch of API that they can use inside their application. But I want to show you actually a demo of it. Uh, let me see. So if you go to the uh, snapshot uh, of GitHub of snapshot, and then there is like the Genie project, and you can have like a sample code in examples. So in the directory examples, there is uh, the folders with all the scripts needed to generate a, a sample demo for Android and iOS, but even for the web platform, because we all, they are also in, they also improve Genie to support the web platform. So that means that it's like uh, using WebAssembly. So they are like translating the C++ code inside WebAssembly. And you can use inside your TypeScript or JavaScript project, the same library, the same algorithm that you are using inside your mobile app and your, uh, your mobile app with iOS and Android. So um, the Genie project files is like, if you download the, the, the example file, you will see, you will have a project like this. In this case, I open it with Visual Studio uh, code and the core of, the, of whatever Genie project you want to uh, create, it's not simple. You have to create a Genie files describing the export and interface of the C++ method that you will want to use inside your mobile app or web app. So in this case, like the demo app is showing, uh, a, um, it's like implementing a sorting between strings. So that means that we will have our mobile app, our web app in which there is like a web, a web uh, there, is like, there is like a text input field where we can put strings. And then we can we have some buttons that we can click to order the string in ascending, descending, or random order. So to do this, we need to think about an interface, like exposing an interface between the underlying C++ code and the app that is on the top. And to do this, we need to write in this language, uh, in this language, our Gini files. So if we write uh, like this, we want, we want an item list, an item list that is a record and a record containing a list of strings called item. This code, this bunch of code, we generate the C++ header that is actually creating a item, an item list struct containing a list, in this case, a vector in C++ of strings called items. This is auto-generated. Then, uh, for for example, you can have like the second the second code that we have like here is like create an enum called sort order, and this enum will have ascending, descending, and random values assigned. If we go to the sort items HPP, so the header file, we will see that. Uh, oh no, sort order dot uh, We have the enum class uh, with the uh, field that we actually assign it in the Gini files. So after we define these Gini files, you have to run the Gini tools to, uh, to create all these generated code. Creating the generated code, we, don't, no, we don't, not only create the uh, C++ header file, but we also create a Java file that you can use in your Android app with the item list, see here, or the Gini, the Gini interface. So this is like something more complex as I showed you before. So like wrapping with the JNA interface, uh, the call to the C++ code, or even like the Objective-C code that is needed with the bridging header. Remember the things that I told you, like you need to use this in your Xcode project for, for iOS. So it's pretty much uh, complicated to integrate C++ inside your mobile app, iOS on Android. But with that tool like this, it can become really easy to produce all the codes needed for this. And even the 
code that will be dedicated to the translation in uh, as uh, in web assembly. Uh, after that, you actually have to uh, to create your uh, C++ code. Like if you want to implement the sorting, we can use, uh, we can actually create our C++ code, including the header files auto-generated by Genie, and then uh, fill it with our logic. So let's say that, uh, ah, I didn't show you that actually we want to uh, perform our sort, we want a sort method that is able to have as an input the order sort, the sort order, and the items that, the, the items that I want to sort. So in this way, I'm declaring, okay, Gini, generate for me a function for this. Gini, gener we generate the, sign the signature of the function in C++, the, the code neither in Java and Swift, and then we can fill it with the actual logic in our C++ file inside and written SRC. So you can see like that um, we are using a standard, the standard library sort uh, for C++ with the uh, argument passed by the sort function and with uh, a different in, in this, as long we are like choosing different case uh, on the uh, as long as we are really uh, ascending, ascending order, descending order, or random order. So uh, this is more or less like the simple stuff around Genie. Obviously, like it's a project that is pretty much complex because you can use uh, a lot of like data types. Uh, I suggest you to, if you're interested, to see the, the readme files and also to experiment it with the demo code. And to build all this project, uh, the sample project, they are using Bezel. That is like a build, building system, uh, uh, so not Gradle, but you can use whatever you want and for your app, obviously. And if you are using Bezel in the command line, you just need to build the Android app with this command line. So Bezel build example Android app or uh, uh, for iOS app, you can just open the sample code generated with iOS with Xcode and run it. Uh, I want to I want to see. Yes, maybe we can. This is like the actual code that I. Um, that I open and modify it from Genie inside its code. Uh, so this is like the sorting uh, sample. Let's see. Okay, this is like, let's see if I can show you the emulator. Yes, let's see. It's running. So this is the demo app that Genie has as a demo code. So like you can uh, put some crash, <laughs> like the every demo, every light demo. So like let's put type and then uh, crash and then Giovanni and then uh, Android and Kotlin. So this string, if, I, if we press sort, the strings are gonna uh, be sorted in a normal order. We can choose reverse order or random order. And then so like, it's very easy analyzing the code of this uh, demo project to check what is the power of this tool uh, that Snap is using, but even other projects are using. So this like, think about it as a tool that helps you to put your C++ code and use it inside Android, iOS, and web. Change language, Kotlin. We, I, I guess a lot of us know Kotlin. I don't want to add a more, more info about Kotlin. Yes, it's modern. I like it very much to, to develop, like for developing uh, Android apps. It's conscious, it's like, it's conscious inter interoperable because it can like, be used for a lot of uh, interaction with different language. Was created by by JetBrains to improve the experience on the JVM. Uh, it has the null safety, the powerful coroutines, type inference, 
and is the, uh, yeah, like I said before, it's the language for Android. Uh, if you want to use Kotlin to build a low level, like, uh, like actually more close to the machine code library that is that can be used in iOS, there is like the possibility. Uh, this is like, I don't want to, to describe you more this, but you can go to, um, I did some research, but like in the kotlinlang.org docs, there is like the way, there is like, there are the instructions that uh, describe how to actually use Kotlin to build a native framework for iOS. For Android, yes, we say we can use Kotlin in a plain and easy way. It's the developer like default now language for, uh, for the Android apps. But if we want to start developing, because the, the two things, the two like for iOS and Android, like using Kotlin can be a little bit different. But if you want to think, about, sorry, about a um, way to use, to develop a library for both the platform, we need to think about Kotlin Multifab platform about. So Kotlin Multifab, uh, this will not be a talk about how to use Kotlin Multifab. There are a lot all around. Uh, it's actually, it's a pretty, uh, this is like a multi-platform mobile is in beta, but I use it a lot and it's pretty much usable. I would say that it's almost stable. stable. And it's an easy way, really easy and efficient way to share code between apps, Android apps and uh, iOS app. Now, uh, the things that I like more of Kotlin multi-platform is like that is, in comparison with it, with C++, in this case, it's much more easy to configure a project to use uh, the Kotlin code that you are using, that you want to develop. Uh, yes, you have to deal with Gradle. Uh, you have to deal with a lot of configuration in Gradle. But uh, if you compare it with C++, there is a lot uh, less to write in, uh, in terms of like how to handling the, the bindings between the, the native library you will want to build and the uh, front end part of the app. So the Swift code of the code and code. The third language that I want to, that I analyze and I want to tell you is like Rust. So what is Rust? Rust was created by Mozilla as a safer alternative to C and C++. So it's like, it's always like creating a language to improve the previous fixing the issues of the previous after ages of experience of bugs and crazy you know, developers getting crazy working with kind of with like all kind of language is that's one of the most important things like is memory and trade safe it has a pretty weird uh, way to deal with memory but pretty weird but really uh, effective way to, uh, to, trade, uh, to deal with memory that is like the borrowing. Uh, so uh, give it a try. I mean, you get, go inside, uh, go in the Rust uh, official documentation, go analyze some uh, some tutorial with Rust, and you will see that even that is like a language that has like a very peculiar syntax, and then sometimes can be a little bit complicated. But after you are starting to use it, you can feel more. Uh, you can you can feel the safety using a, the language, and it's a high performance language because it's right really close to C plus C plus plus. It has no garbage collector like Kotlin. Uh, Kotlin has a garbage collection collector. Java has a garbage, the, 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 the garbage collector, but Rust and C plus plus not as not. So this will mean like they will not uh, deal with the time losing time with the garbage collection and because of the borrowing system, it will be even safe using like uh, in terms of memory use. It's actually Rust has been for seven years in a row, the most loved language in Stack Overflow uh, survey, developer survey. So the more it's growing, the community is growing a lot. The more people are using Rust, the more are loving Rust. Uh, I started uh, like four months ago uh, not specific, specifically for Android app, but related to the Android apps. And 
I'm starting to use even for uh, Android apps, like uh, for building algorithm in integrated with Android apps. Uh, it's very, like I said, the community is growing a lot and there are lots of uh, libraries also constantly written uh, in Rust that you can use. Uh, it has like a package system, dependency system called Cargo. That is like, I like to say, to see Cargo as like a better version of NPM. Uh, so yeah, it has like a versioning. It's like, a, it, it has a safe, way to uh, download uh, the dependency respecting the number that you want to put. Uh, this is like the one sample of uh, Rust code. So it's like uh, uh, giving the average of the numbers entered in a common line. So this is a common line application. Like you can see that there are variable indicated with let, the function is not object oriented, it's more functional than, uh, than other language. It means that you can use like uh, fun program functional programming uh, with Rust, and pretty much, if you are coming from C plus plus, can become can be it, it Rust have some familiar function uh, that you can use. If you are coming from Kotlin and Swift, it's easy to understand some Rust syntax. But there are other part of Rust, the Rust syntax that you really need to be focused and study what the heck is doing. And even like the most complicated part of Rust is the compiler. The compiler of Rust is very strict and is giving you a lot of error. And that's why it's safe when you are, the, it's more safe than other language. It's safer than other language because when you are fixing a lot of bugs before actually putting the software in production, you will have a safer executables, like you say. Uh, from what I know, it's also has also been integrated inside the Linux kernel, and even in Android. I think from this year they will start to put in the ASP uh, some Rust code. So like you can actually build straight away from now. Like uh, that's I know this is very esoteric. Like some Android service using Rust, and another like uh, nice thing is like. We are talking about sustainability a lot during this day, and it seems that it's one of the uh, the most efficient uh, language in terms of energy, together with C. Obviously, C is very old. Uh, it has like some issues, like uh, it's not really safe to use, uh, like Rust. Rust combine the safety with uh, a great performance. Uh, you can see like Python is one of the least efficient one in terms of energy. The second and the third column is like more uh, time performance and memory uh, and peak usage of memory. So like there is a Pascal Gossi and Fortran are like uh, really good and the C++ and Rust that's like is in a good position. Uh, if you see like language like Java, oh, there is no Kotlin here. My guess is like close to the Java, uh, to the Java position should be. Uh, so this is like, you can look on internet this, this um, uh, information about sustainability and also in the AWS, because Rust is used a lot even in the uh, uh, cloud space, in the cloud field, uh, because it's efficient. And because like there, in that kind of field, the performance are important because when you are building services, the uh, cost, uh, as long like they are cost dependent associated with time, uh, so if you have to execute some services, the least time, the less time you are using, the less you are paying for it, and the most efficient it is. So like Rust is used a lot even for for this because like it's super fast and super safe. And there is like uh, uh, in the Amazon uh, AWS blogs, uh, there is like a, a a blog post about the sustainability with Rust, and there are also other uh, information about Rust in the cloud space. So let's get it. Let's get it back to the mobile space. How can I use Rust uh, in an iOS app development? So there is, if you look in Google, the one of the first results that you will find uh, that you will find is like the official uh, official Mozilla documentation. It was created by Mozilla. Mozilla also have the uh, the content that will guide you to build and deploying a Rust library on iOS. Yes, you need to install uh, 
the command line tool for Xcode. Uh, you need to install Rust app. That is like a tool to install the uh, target, um, compile, um, we'll say, we shall compile architecture executable to, to build executable for ARM, uh, iOS, and so specifically for the hardware related to the iOS, uh, related to iOS. And then after that, you can cross compile your Rust code inside the uh, executable capable or, or running on uh, iOS. Uh, this is this tutorial is pretty old, and there is some like uh, there, there is like a better way to understand uh, and to develop with it. We're gonna see this in a bit. And for Android, there is more or less uh, the same things. But for Android, yeah, because like you will have to pass through the native Java and to the JNA Java native interface, you will have to download anyway all the tooling that we downloaded before for C so CMake, NDK, Gradle is configured in a certain way, and the LLDB. But also Mozilla have a tutorial as a tutorial about how to build and deploy a Rust library on Android. So uh, I will share the link in the chat in a bit. But it's very easy. You can look for it uh, if you Google it. But I will suggest you to uh, to look inside another to look for another resource, and then I will share with you. And this is the one that I sh that I use for my demo. Uh, so like Rust app, okay, with a lot of NDK for Android. Uh, how can interface Rust with a different language, or so with Kotlin or uh, with Swift? So Rust like as a things called foreign function interface, that is a way to interface and to call um, to call function from Rust outside. And also Mozilla created a unify. I hope the pronunciation is correct. Unify with double F. It's like from unify. That's the, the reason like it's like unifying Rust for uh, with the other platform. So this unify is a tool that is that you will have to download and install and will generate it's pretty similar to Gini. So this will able to generate the bindings for Kotlin, for Swift, and we will see even for the web. So even for this, even using Rust, you can use the uh, you can like create a library that can be shared between the three platforms, web, Android, and iOS. Uh, Unify supports Kotlin, Swift, Python, and Ruby as well. So you can also uh, create some Ruby project or Python project that will use the same library that you are shared with the mobile platform. It's pretty powerful. Uh, let's see a demo. So I prefer to, uh, there is like a very valid uh, project. And this project is here. Mm. Building platform, this one, building cross-platform Rust for web under the iOS, a minimal example. So this code was, this article was like in, is in a personal blog here. And it's very, it, it has, it's one of the most simple tutorial that I saw created by Andy Balam. Uh, it's one of the most simple tutorial that I saw about how created a shared library between these three platforms. And it's more, even if it's the most simple, it's pretty much complicated because like it's not it's not like an easy work and it's not a work in the park. So uh, the things like you, uh, if we start with Android, we need to uh, to create our logic in the normal Rust code. So let's see, I have the project here. I have a project here. Yes, exactly. So. Uh, um, so let's see inside these crates, create, uh, by the way, the crates are like the package, the libraries, whatever software I can put inside a bunch of function of our Rust program. So let's say that I have a, uh, my crates example Rust bindings and inside source, there is my lib.rs, uh, uh, RS, that is a Rust file. So in this Rust file is like uh, 
Mm, this is like one of my custom function that I use for my benchmark is the SIBO veratosterans. I will show you this before what it is, but it's essentially like a function to uh, find prime number. And this is my code. So I wrote this by hand. Okay. Then I have a Let's see if we see like, I wrote the, code, the normal code inside my bind bindings. I need to write a UDL file. This is, will be very similar to the, um, to the file that we use for Gini. Mm -hmm. so something we need to create to describe the interface that we want to export. So the FI inside bindings, FFI, my last code UDL. So this will be the exported interface that we want for our code. So we say that I want a, uh, a class that is an interface that has a string, my method, and this like, uh, and a namespace or Rust that is like creating the class that I defined it before. So with this, actually, so creating this UDL file and then implementing the interfaces for it will be used by Unify, by the command line of Unify to generate the files like in Gini that we need to be integrated with our iOS code and our Android code. So the things like we, we can see, we can see the generate code here. Um, the things like, the the Rust, the Unify will generate the code for us, the interfaces code for us, but even we compile our library inside a, a SO file that we can link in our project, iOS or Android. So if we like, we build this, let's say that we want to build uh, this project that I created following this tutorial, I can integrate the, this is the project I want to show you the, in this case, let's take the Android project. So let's see the, uh, the Android project using the Rust project that I'll show you before with Unify. So like, if we go to the main activity, the main activity will have a value here created that is actually there will be exactly the class that I want to call to generate my output. So I call it like in a very dumb way, like my class, my method. Okay. So I can, I can call it create my class and then I can call the method and then I can receive the output. But if I, if I go to my Rust code, this is actually auto generated by Unify. Auto generated by Unify, even from the command line and from a part of Unify, a command that I put inside a Gradle file. So this is like a little, a little bit complicated. Like you need to touch even the uh, the command, the, the Gradle file. But essentially, this is like uh, will tell Gradle to call Unify BitGen to generate taking in account the UDL file that I create. So the interface, the interface file. So they create the bindings for Kotlin inside that directory that I will tell you here as an argument. And then Unify will create this bunch of code here that can be a little bit complicated to read. That can be used essentially in the Android project. For iOS is more or less the same. So I suggest you to follow the, uh, the tutorial here at this page, there are the steps for iOS, there are the steps for Android, and there are the steps for uh, for uh, WebAssembly. This is the most, this is the easiest, one of the easiest tutorials I found on the internet. Uh, I'm actually planning to release a couple of tutorials to make it more easier to understand with a simple project, uh, because I created, I started to work on a demo project to understand uh, the performance between the three language. Uh, speaking about the performance, I also suggest you to see, to watch a video on YouTube, sharing code between iOS and Android with Rust. 
where there is a really good uh, performance analysis between these languages, especially uh, Benedict in this talk will talk about uh, time-based performance analysis, like you will see that C++ here is faster than Rust, but Rust is faster than Kodi. Thank you, we can expect that. Uh, but there is also a comparison between imperative and functional programming with these languages. And even in terms of memory, Rust is like uh, really, really well optimized, uh, even in comparison with Swift. So even compared with the uh, with the native platform of, of iOS, there is no actually no like uh, match with Kotlin, obviously, like because it, like it always occupies a lot of memory. And I'm creating uh, like. I showed you before, like a, a performance analysis using the Sivo Veratosten. The Sivo Veratosten is like an algorithm, an ancient algorithm to generate prime numbers. And this is like essentially used a lot in benchmarking. So I, if you're interested, I will like uh, I'll show you this in the following days. Uh, the project even integrated with Android and iOS and web. But like to summarize, I think my idea is like, you have to choose C++ if you want fast performance. You want like easiness to find developers because there are a lot of developers that they can work with C++, especially not in the mobile field. You can find them a lot. Uh, it's hard to find skilled developers because like, like, I saw, like I showed you before, C++ has a lot of pitfalls and safety can be an issue. There can be like even security issue of uh, using developing code with C++. There is an article on released by Google like one month ago about how also they improve a lot uh, many, they improve a lot of security issue, uh, they fix a lot of security issue just like porting from C++ to us. This is like uh, cloud-based uh, projects. And it like the things like I found really complex integrating C++ with C, with Android iOS project. So the most straightforward way is Eugenie. That e even though it's like I as uh, I show you, it's not like super straightforward. So you need like maybe a team that is able to integrate the apps with. So you need like a sort of DevOps for libraries that you are like producing. Choose Kotlin, yes, it's less performance, but it's perfectly well integrated with the ID. Of course, it's created by JetBrains. If you use IntelliJ, if you use Understudio, it's like super well integrated. Yes, you will have a little bit to uh, fight with Gradle, but I think Gradle like is uh, less uh, problem uh, oriented one no? with the other tools, uh, way of combining the three languages. Uh, it's a sort of similar with Swift. With Swift, yes, I know Swift developers sometimes they don't want to use like Kotlin, but it's very familiar for them to use it as well, to me. It's safe. I mean, there is like the null check and this kind of easiness that make you, uh, as a developer, like more uh, happy and safe of develop something that is safe. And this to and easy to use multi-platform. There are a lot of tutorials around the web and videos about how to use it as a multi-platform. A lot of developers are using it and big companies are using it now as a multi-platform. But uh, the point of this, of this presentation was even considering the performance-based algorithms and Kotlin is the less performant one. Rust in comparison is safe, is high performance, uh, can be integrate like C++ with Unify, not with Gini. Uh, it's ready for the web uh, with WebAssembly, uh, but the big problem is the steep that I found is a steep learning curve. Uh, I still like uh, after four or five months, like learning a lot of stuff with it. And it can be a little bit complicated. Yes, I love Rust, but sometimes like uh, I'm banging my head to find the errors and even like, uh, even can be hard to um, make your own mind uh, like following the, the the same logic of Rust. Let's say, but it's the most slow because they say that after you uh, use, I think after you spend a lot like creating your uh, things with Rust, you understand this philosophy and you will lie. Uh, you will love it, and then you don't want to touch anything. It's like yeah, that's the, the dream work. 
And the, the things that I really like in Rust is the good dependency system. Like I said before, it's a better NPM. Cargo is a better NPM. Cosmo, Cargo is the package and dependency system of Rust. I think it's even integrated with the building system, the testing system. So it's a really well, uh, it's a really well ecosystem. It's a well done, it's a really well done ecosystem. My two cents, like I will continue to explore Rust for it, for, uh, for like developing high performance multi-platform library. That's why I said the high performance is like the, the keywords in this kind of, uh, of, of choice because you can choose whatever tool you, you have to choose the right tool for the right job so if you have to use like if you are not focused on the high performance you can be you can use Kotlin as well and it's pretty much easier but if you are really really focused on performance like imagine like you have to get data from sensor in a very from sensor like accelerometer, uh, barometer, like magnetometer from a smartphone. And you have to elaborate that tiny in a really strict way, in a really uh, fast way with the most optimization as possible. So the choice can, um, in my opinion, Rust can be an optimal choice. So like for me, that's all. Uh, I know it's like pretty much a lot. It's a lot of like complicated things to digest and to show. Maybe I, I want when I when I thought about the presentation, I thought about creating three main different presentation, but it was like it's just like an intro on about what you can do, and even I want to warn you about how complicated it can be to integrate with tool and languages that are not really designed to interact with the original native language of your platform. Even though that original native platform languages and framework of your platform are not really well suitable for high performance uh, algorithm that you can, that you may want and you may need for your use case. Yeah, that's it. I don't know if there are questions. Yeah, thank you, Giovanni. So, yeah, I, I don't see any question, but let let uh, let me uh, wait a little bit for so maybe someone will come up with a question. So yeah, please yeah, no please write in the chat. In the meantime, uh, if you're not talking about these three languages, is there anything else someone should look at this aspect, or is there really these are just the three options in your opinion? So uh, there is another option that I didn't consider. It was like. Uh, Flutter. I didn't consider Flutter still because like Flutter is more designed for uh, creating beautiful, like they say, UI, uh, beautiful user experience app. So it's more like UI framework, but I think they are improving a lot that platform even for, for performance. And there is like also React Native with a new architecture especially with a new architecture that uh, is really well suited for high, high performance uh, use cases. Uh, I'm not an expert in React Native, uh, and, there, and, and I know a lot of developers that hate React Natives and like, the one that loves React Native. So like, because my background was more like coming from C++, I analyzed this language and because even I think these three are more or less the one, the one, the, the one that I like the most. Um, Kotlin coming from the under development, C++ from my background, and it was like the actually, the, it was like the the, the favorite choice. Even like we saw in the previous talk of Zach, uh, from many people like developing shared libraries before, uh, and Rust because it's a brand new one that can be used. And that's the performance of uh, C++ with the agility of programming that we can have with code. That's what I think. OK, thanks. So there's still no questions, but I, I, <laughs> I, I have one, another one. So yeah. you talked about uh, different cross-platform solutions. How would you actually decide between going full native on all platforms and or cross-platform? Sorry, can you? I didn't get you the most. Yeah, so, so how would you decide between using a cross platform solution like the ones that you detailed or going fully native for each platform? So the thing is like if you're going fully native, uh, 
it is it's not sure that you can achieve like the i mean analyzing the the problem is like building something that is high performance you are not sure to build the really the most high performance algorithm like i know that it's like can be weird this uh, but you are not sure so like using a really low level language can be like the one that is closer to the machine can give you this uh, possibility but the things like and then you have the problem like because like when you are like spending a lot to build something with a language that is not even the native language of your platform, uh, you don't want to do the work uh, double of the time. So that's the, that's the, this is the need also. This is like originating the needs of sharing the, the things that like you can develop something. You will be sure that you in C++ you will actually have a really good performance not considering on the issue that you can have like with null pointer and pointer arithmetic, okay, all the difficulties. But then after you spend a lot, you will want to share this with Android, with iOS, and with whatever like lang platform you would, may want to run. But that's the thing. Okay, thank you. I no think problem. that's all then. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your amazing talk. It's, uh, it's contained a lot of information. So. Yes, yes. <laughs> I hope you yeah, share, my, share the slides because I think it would be great to, to look back at it. Yeah, yeah, this was like, uh, yeah, I will share the slide. There are also the URL, but also you can contact me. That's my website. So if you're interested, you can contact me because I'm still like working on the uh, the demos and the performance analysis. So like somebody's interest, that's it. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you again. And bye. Thank you.